You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hi everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Farid Borspuya. In this week's program, we have a special one for you because Mariam is going away to Washington to attend the Reason Rally. Um, so we have an interview with Alexander Betts, the uh, Director of Refugee Studies at Oxford, which is apt and it's quite a important issue and the right moment to discuss this. Yeah, we, and we did think that it's a good time to really focus on this issue, have a program that's specially on it. So do stay and watch this fantastic interview. We drove up to Oxford uh, University a few weeks ago and we uh, met him at his office and um, spoke to him about lots of different issues from refugees as resources to EU policy, whether uh, it's good, bad, or mediocre. Stay with us. Hi, Alex Brett. Thank you very much for doing an interview with us. I wanted to ask about the migrant crisis today. It's the worst in contemporary history? Uh, around the world, we have more displaced people than any time since the Second World War. There are around 60 million displaced, around 20 million refugees around the world. But I think what really has created a sense of a refugee crisis is the fact that unprecedented numbers of people are coming to Europe. Relatively small in the global context, but last year over a million asylum seekers came to Europe from outside the Europe region, the largest number from Syria. And that's created a sense of panic amongst European politicians, a decline in the liberal values and liberal response of Europe, and a real uncertainty about responses. And so I think we need to get in context that it's a million people that have come to Europe, but compare that to the numbers of Syrians being hosted by countries like Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon, and the fact that Europe has 28 member states, we need to get a sense of perspective and see it in proportion. Perspective-wise, can you tell us a bit about the numbers? How are the numbers so different uh, elsewhere as opposed to Europe? Yeah, I mean, Turkey hosts more refugees than any other country in the world. If we take the Syrians, there are over 5 million Syrian refugees in total, over 2.5 million are in Turkey, uh, over a million are in Lebanon, over 600,000 are in Jordan. And if we look to Europe, the total number of asylum seekers is around a million, of whom probably around 750,000 are Syrian refugees. But Europe, of course, has a large number of member states, and those people coming to Europe are inequitably distributed across the Europe region. So Germany, Hungary, Sweden are the largest recipient countries for Syrian refugees. Some will say that the panic is because this lot of migrants are different from previous ones. What would you say to that? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think Europe has managed with large migratory inflows and refugee crises in the past, during the Second World War, most notably. But even since then, even Muslim populations have come to Europe uh, and been integrated as asylum seekers. In the early 1990s, there were large numbers of Bosnian refugees. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, there were large numbers of Kosovar refugees, hundreds of thousands, who were accepted by European countries and then were able to return home. What's different today is that in the aftermath of September the 11th, 2001, Islam is politically toxic in Europe. And we may not state it, politicians may not acknowledge it, but underlying a lot of the response is a latent Islamophobia. It's a lot about race, it's a lot about religion, and people are not acknowledging that as openly and outwardly as they need to in order to confront it, challenge it, and open up our asylum policies in a more liberal way. Um, I think the real challenge is that we're seeing far-right challenger parties emerging across Europe. Git Wilders in the Netherlands, Marine Le Pen in France, uh, Nigel Farage in the UK, and then leaders like Viktor Orban pandering to populist nationalism. And the consequences across Europe, we see a race to the bottom in terms of standards. Austria introducing quotas, the UK working with France to close the jungle camps in Calais, shootings at the Macedonian border, 
um, attempts by the Danes to um, seize assets and property from arriving refugees, examples in Germany of Muslims being banned from public swimming pools. This is a collapse of our values. We're detaining children and we're doing it in part because of the unacknowledged recognition that these people are predominantly Muslims. What do you say to people who say, well, th 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 we do need to look at this issue differently because of terrorism, because of jihadism, because of Islamism and its rise across the globe? There are very real public fears and concerns about terrorism. Those are valid public worries. But I think the problem is that we're equating refugees and asylum with a terrorist threat. And there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that somebody who is a refugee is any more likely, statistically, to be a refugee than someone from the general population. Equally, there's very little evidence controlling for variation in socioeconomic background that being a refugee makes you any more likely to commit a crime than anyone else. We've got to keep in mind that so many of the refugees coming to Europe at the moment are fleeing conflict and fleeing the violence perpetrated by terrorist organizations like Islamic State, and they're fleeing the same things that European publics are concerned about. So we've absolutely got to separate refugee movements from a genuine public fear about terrorism. What's the root of the migrant crisis today? Is it different from previous um, crises? And today's movements are predominantly a refugee crisis. Most people coming to Europe are fleeing refugee-producing countries. The biggest sending country is Syria. And nearly everyone leaving from Syria is a refugee. They simply cannot maintain a basic standard of living with the violence and conflict in that country. After that, we see many people coming from fragile and failed states. Afghanistan, Iraq, for instance. And in Africa, we see people leaving Somalia and Eritrea. So the number of refugees in the world is basically related to the number of conflicts around the world and the number of authoritarian regimes that persecute their own populations. It's that combination of fragile and weak states on the one hand, with new opportunities for mobil mobility in the context of globalization, that means what we see today is not a one-off, but it's likely to be a set of patterns that will be with us for the foreseeable future. Until we address conflicts at their root causes, like the violence in Syria, until we rebuild fragile states like Afghanistan, Iraq and Somalia, inevitably, given the chance to move, people will take those opportunities and they will travel immediately to neighboring countries. But if they can't get access to basic dignity, the opportunity to work, basic freedoms, they will have to inevitably move onwards and embark on dangerous journeys to Europe and elsewhere. You talk about uh, contradictions in the humanitarian response and the, the people's outlook on this issue. Can you explain that a bit? I mean, I think there are massive contradictions in, in public attitudes and responses. In theory, Europe is premised upon liberal values of, of tolerance, openness, freedom of movement, respect for human rights. But it's European values that are really at stake here. There's a crisis of those liberal European values. And while we espouse freedoms, while we say that we should have freedom of press, freedom of speech, we're undermining those basic values in our treatment of refugees and asylum seekers from other parts of the world. I mean, the idea, for instance, that we collectively um, ban Muslims from public swimming pools in certain parts of Germany, the idea that in certain areas of public canteens in Denmark, um, they are trying to enforce a minimum serving of pork and, and sausages, ostensibly to preserve the Danish pork industry, is a display of overt discrimination. And I think it's those contradictions that Europe has to recognize and confront. We should, should maintain our liberal values. Now, that means saying, yes, freedom of speech, that no values, no beliefs are sacrosanct, just because people say they hold opinions because of religion, doesn't mean we can't open to debate, doesn't mean we can't scrutinize them, doesn't mean we can't criticize them. But on the other hand, we should equally allow freedom of conscience, freedom of religious belief. Insofar as people's beliefs and values do not threaten or harm anyone else, people should have a freedom to believe and pursue their own religious values. But it should all be premised upon a liberal social contract of freedom 
for refugees, freedom for asylum seekers, and freedoms for our own populations to debate openly, to have freedom of speech, and where necessary, to openly criticise um, verbally values we disagree with. You talk about refugees being a resource. Can you explain that a bit more? I think very often refugees have been conceived as passive humanitarian victims, as people who we have to deliver food, clothing and shelter to in refugee camps. And that perception creates many problems. Over half of the world's refugees are in so-called protracted refugee situations. They're often kept in camps for five, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years, without the right to work, without freedom of movement. But we've embarked on some research, mainly in East Africa, looking at one particular country, Uganda. And in Uganda, they give refugees the right to work. They give them freedom of movement. They don't leave them indefinitely in confined camps. And we've collected data systematically that shows that not only in those situations do refugees help themselves, but they contribute to the economy of the host country. So to take an example, in the capital city of Uganda, Kampala, 21% of refugees own businesses that employ other people. And of those they employ, 40% of the employees are nationals of the host country. In other words, given the chance, refugees create jobs for citizens. And I think the same logic can apply in the Middle East and in Europe. If we empower refugees, educate them, train them, give them basic economic freedoms, they don't have to be an inevitable burden. They can contribute until they're able to go home. And uh, there was uh, something you said uh, on Twitter that I really liked. It said, what I expected to feel was a sense of pity. What I found was a source of inspiration. And that was after you visited a refugee camp, was it? So I was referring to the first experiences I had working with refugees. As a 19-year-old student, I spent a summer in the Netherlands just doing voluntary work with asylum seekers from around the world. And I met people from Kosovo, Bosnia, Iraq, Iran, Liberia, former Zaire, China, and I met doctors, nurses, lawyers. I was taught table tennis by uh, a former Iranian professional table tennis player. I was taught the basis of public international law by a Bosniak lawyer, and I felt a sense of inspiration. But what was tragic was these people were stuck in limbo. They weren't immediately given the right to work. They weren't having their skills recognised. And so at, at that time, my first experience of refugees was that I assumed they would be humanitarian victims, but they had skills, they had talents, they had aspirations. And so I felt that it was important that people privileged enough to have the voice to open up rights and opportunities for those people argue for their rights. You talk about there being a need for an alternative response to the situation. What do you mean by that? I think we need to radically rethink how Europe is currently responding to the refugee crisis. The European Union response has been dire. Uh, much of the chaos and tragedy has been utterly avoidable. We need a response that's different on three levels. We need to recognise that most refugees are in the neighbouring countries to the country of origin. Syrians are mainly in Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. We can't keep people indefinitely in camps, but we can't leave them in destitution in urban areas like Amman and Beirut. We have to create economic opportunity. So at a first level, our response has to be economic empowerment, jobs, education, reconceiving a response in those areas. And if it can't be done in the capital cities like Amman and Beirut, then we need to create a development model that supports the development of those host countries and their jump to manufacturing while creating jobs. And I, with a colleague, Paul Collier, have proposed an idea of economic zones in those border areas in countries like Jordan to help Jordanians get jobs alongside Syrians, to incubate Syrian businesses until people can go home. But at a second level, we need to make sure people's journeys across the Aegean, across the Mediterranean, are safe. People are drowning and dying unnecessarily. What we can do is think about humanitarian visas. Why is it that someone should have to pay a smuggler a thousand euros to travel from Bodrum to Berlin when a budget airline flight costs 200 euros? If we allowed people a visa to travel and then claim asylum when they got to Europe, we would save lives, we would undercut the market for smuggling, we would take the pressure off the frontline states and the Greek islands. Brazil has piloted humanitarian visas, Italy is starting, and within Europe we need a fair distribution of asylum seekers across Europe. That's the third level. Europe needs to develop a new common European asylum system. 
it has to fairly and equitably share responsibility across the 28 EU member states. At the moment it's failing to develop that deal. Its plan A and its only plan is a deal with Turkey that is unworkable, illegal and politically unlikely to succeed. Uh, one other question is about the concept of open borders. Uh, what do you think about that? So I think we need to recognise that the dynamics of mobility are changing in the 21st century. We live in a globalised world. We allow goods and services to move freely across borders. We allow capital to move freely across borders. But with people, we tie people to particular nation states. And of course there is a difference. I mean, like goods and services like tomatoes, um, people form families, they form social ties, they have interactions. But I think governments are living in a 20th century world a Westphalian system based on state sovereignty that doesn't match contemporary reality. We cannot simply move to an open borders world. It's politically infeasible. But I think we need to move to a world where for people who have to move, for human rights reasons, because they live in fragile states, because they face serious socioeconomic deprivations, that confining people to particular countries is not only morally wrong, but it's unsustainable. People will move and we have to adapt to those realities in a way that respects human rights, respects humanitarian crises and recognises that we can all be better off with a degree of freedom of movement for those who need it and for those who are willing and able to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Alexander Betts. I think he raises some really important points there. For me, I think one of the key matters is this accusation uh, when you defend open borders and refugee rights of being pro-Islamist, being pro-jihadi. Well, first of all, uh, the vast majority of people fleeing are, are fleeing the jihadis and the Islamists. But second of all, a human right cannot be linked to uh, people's beliefs, uh, people's race, people's religion, people's uh, gender. Otherwise, it's not really a human right, is it? I mean, the fact of the matter is refugees are neither saints nor sinners. But as people who are fleeing, they deserve the right to protection. I mean, the other thing is that the right to free movement, I've said this many times and some people don't like it, is part of, is part of a fundamental of the human rights. You can't take it away. You can't decide, yes, this person can. The fundamental rights of people is to be able to actually run away and move to a safe place, and you can't take that away. No, and there's this wonderful uh, speech by a Syrian, a young Syrian, which you just showed me, uh, you know, saying, well, you know, people are fleeing today because of the conditions. They weren't fleeing in these numbers five, six years ago, and therefore, you know, there, there's a real need why people flee, and they need a protection, they need to be defended. So. Yes, definitely refugees welcome. Anyway, we've reached the end of this week's special program. We hope you enjoyed it. Do send us your comments. Until next week, we'll see you at the same time and same place. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. 
It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.